Hey, everybody. Wait, it's still buffering. I'm getting a buffering headache <laughs> is what's happening. It's here, we, here we go. Yeah, raining, right? Hey, everybody. Here we are. And this is Thomas Easter. What's up, everybody? <laughs> Say hi to my people. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> totally. This is crazy time. What what's happening on your end, Thomas? Um, probably the same thing that's happening on everybody's end. I'm <laughs> sitting at home. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you been a bad boy? Are you in your room till you get better? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been I've been sitting on my room. I'm grounded right now. <laughs> <laughs> have you been working on jokes or? You know, actually, the past couple of days, I've actually been writing jokes again. Yeah, I didn't feel like it at first. Me neither. No, but now I am. What? Yeah, I've been, back, I've been back at it lately. Just uh, I'll see certain little things, and, uh, and it sets me off, and, and I have to, I'll be like, damn, that's funny. i got to write that down before I forget it, you know? Yeah. So you, you grew up in Atlanta and did comedy in Los Angeles for three years, and now you're here, is that true? Well, I, start, I actually started out here. Oh, how, yeah, long, yeah. how long ago? Uh, six years ago. Whoa. Yep. What made you take the big jump? Uh, just, um, I had played tile for about 10 years previously and was tired of that, and, uh, you know, I, I worked with a friend, so I didn't really have any proof of what I'd done, you know, as far as like a resume goes and shit. And um, so I knew I couldn't really get taken serious at like a major job or anything. And uh, and I didn't really want to do tile anymore. And I'd always just been funny. You know, everybody's always told me, dude, you're funny. Bro. Good luck, you know. And um, so I said, you know, why not? Yes. You yeah. are. You are funny. What's the thing you like talking about the most? That's that's the thing I pride myself on with my comedy is I don't really um, I don't get up there and try to uh, you know change your mind on things. So I don't really talk about search stuff a lot. I, I actually tell jokes. You know, I pride myself on having like a cup. I have like some one liners. Then I have some like jokey jokes with like a you know a premise set up punchline, and then I end with a uh, with a story, a story about my uncle worm, uh, and then uh, boom, and, and that's it. You know, uh, I don't really like you know uh, dog you because you're religious. I don't talk shit because you're gay. I don't care that you're black or you're white. You know, like I don't sit there and uh, you know, or I'm not like gonna be like you know the government's doing this. I don't do all that as a comic. I just tell my jokes. I laugh. With you, because I, you know, when I laugh on stage, I know you're not supposed to, but when I laugh on stage, it's a real laugh. I'm having someone in the state uh, crowd. I see them laugh. I start laughing. You know, it's just, it's just a natural thing. I like to laugh. So um, I don't really have like a subject that I stay on. I just tell a bunch of jokes. You what, know? What's your favorite one-liner that you wrote? Um, if it was raining pussy, I'd get hit with a dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. How did, how did you come up with the ability to write good one-liners? Uh, I don't know. Uh, actually, um, when I was living in L.A., I helped run a club called Marty's. And Marty's is named after a man named Marty. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Marty Paul Forrester, I think, is his real name. And... Uh, He's a great dude, great, very, uh, great. I can't say enough good things about Marty. Uh, and uh, he's the king of one-liners, if you ask me. I know there's a bunch of great one-liner comedians out there, but he's the first one-liner comic I've met to where, like, I mean, for three years I've heard him do the same jokes over and over, and they would, they would get me every time. Some of them just you laugh every time you hear them. And so uh, just, I, I don't know, hearing Marty's jokes over and over like that, I just picked up that ability to, to write, write them myself, you know? Yeah. 
So when you start off your set, do you tend to use the same sort of one-liner or do you look at the crowd and change it? Um, yeah, some, like, uh, you know, at open mics, I, uh, I don't uh, do my opener. You know, opener is one of the hardest things to get in comedy. You know, it's having like a solid, like, way to come on stage and send like the, the you know the right shit to say and it took me a long time to get my opener that I have about living in my van and um, and then I'm just now at it about buying this house so um, I'm on book shows and, and especially if the crowd's never seen me before of course you know that I do pretty much the same opener every time because it's kind of um, it's a mix of a uh, story with one-liners. It's kind of me telling you about myself, but with one-liners, boom, 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 in a row like that. You know? That's amazing. So, yeah, and it's, it's hard to get that, man. I, I've seen a lot of comics struggle with opening. You know, it takes them a, a good three to five minutes or some five to seven, even ten minutes to get going, get, to get the crowd used to them. But I pride myself on being able to come out there and, and start to and get it going, you know. So, That's cool. <laughs> So, um, when you first started doing comedy, what what was going through your head that made you want to be a hero and take the bullet for other people? You know, because we're, we're. I, I didn't. Um, I wasn't. A, I didn't grow up a, a fan of comedy like most comics, as far as where like they know like the background of older comedians and and, and the history of comedy and all that. But you know, I grew up an athlete and. My favorite people, you know, my first favorite person was like Dominique Wilkins and uh, Richard Petty and, and people like that, you know, athletes. So I didn't know that going first was biting the bullet. I was so dumb as a comic starting out. I thought going first meant that I was like the best comic and shit. So the first time I got booked on a show and they were like, you're first, I was like, yeah, first comic, baby. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like I was the headliner or something. You know, so I had no clue that going first was a bad thing. So I've never treated it as a bad thing. And I think that dumbness, you know, actually made me a stronger comic. So I, even to this day, if I have to start a show or host or host a show, which if you're a host, you're basically the first comic, you know, um, and I can start it. I can start it good, you know. So that's like being having the pole. Sorry, the pole position. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> because you just started comedy, dumbass. Like, yeah, you know, like. <laughs> That's great. So, who did anybody get you into it, or did you do it on a dare? What happened there? Uh, no, no, I, I don't know. Not really a dare. Just uh, people around me always telling me that I was funny and see, you know, and on the East coast growing up in Georgia, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have California as a state next door with, with the Hollywood letters in the mountain, you know, we don't have stuff like that out there. You know, uh, the, that dream isn't real to people like us out there. Um, you know, when I was a kid now, of course, there's a, a lot more opportunity in Georgia and Atlanta, but as a kid in the eighties and nineties in Atlanta, Georgia, I, uh, the last thing on my mind was ever being an actor or a comedian. So it wasn't until I actually moved out here to Las Vegas in my thirties and was around people from the West coast who have the, that mentality that was really pushing me to do it. So I'd say like one of the first people to really push me was a neighbor I had when I lived up in like the Summerlin area, she was like, a, um, she's a California chick and you can tell she's like, she used to be in the industry and stuff. And she, she was always telling me how funny and how the camera would love you. She's a photographer and all this stuff. And, uh, she just always was real positive about it. And, um, so I don't know. I just, but like I said, I got sick of the tile stuff and ended back. And I was just kind of like, uh, you know, one of those when you're in that mood, like, you know, fuck it, I'm going to show the world type of deal, you know? So that, that's kind of how it was, the attitude I had. Just, you know what? They think I'm funny. They think I can be a comic. I'll, I'll do it then, you know? And I just did it. <laughs> so what kind of athlete were you? Uh, uh, my favorite, I think I'm the best at basketball, everybody would tell you. Anybody who's ever seen me play will tell you. 
I'm the best at basketball. But then I'll tell them, that's just because you ain't ever seen me play football. I was a great receiver. I could catch any ball thrown at me. Um, and I'm fast as lightning. I've always been either the first or second fastest player on every team I've ever played on. You know, they, they used to always call me white lightning um, and football and like white mind and stuff like that. So um, I was always pretty good, you know. And then baseball, um, I was always good. I always wanted to pitch, but they wanted me in the outfield because I was fast. And so I took it the wrong way. I thought that they were being assholes and put me in the outfield, you know. And uh, they wouldn't let me pitch. I was all mad about it, you know. So uh, I would say basketball is my favorite, best sport, you know. Basketball. What position did you play? Uh, one and two guard. That's point guard and shooting guard. Nice. So did you have aspirations to go into the NBA? Nah, I didn't have, um, I mean, if, you know, at a young, at a very young age in Georgia, I got arrested for selling marijuana and uh, they made me a felon because of that, unfortunately. So uh, any dreams of going to like uh, being professional would have been squashed because of that anyway. But, you know, I could never uh, stay out of jail after that. Um, they put me on probation. I was always violating for smoking marijuana, <laughs> you know, being a teenager, basically, you know, they put me on probation at 18, you know, and uh, it's just hard to get off. You know? I think they like, should wipe all those off the records now. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah, yeah. So you, what's it like having grown up in Atlanta and now living here and meeting, I'm sure you've met celebrities in L.A., uh, it was, it was, I, you know, it's funny, like, you hear the stories about going to L.A., and, um, I mean, I wasn't in that, I literally wasn't in L.A. 30 minutes before I see Craig Robinson from the Hot Tub Time Machine. I mean, I had just, I Googled, um, I Googled the comedy store, right? I drove from, it. Uh, I didn't drive from it. I drove from Atlanta to Vegas, and I had stayed here in town because, like I said, I started comedy out here, so I knew I, I knew people. So I pit stopped here. So I from from Las Vegas, I googled comedy store, right? And so I go to the comedy store. By the time I made it there, it was middle of the day, and they wasn't open yet. So I go right down the street from there, and I parked in this parking lot that was ten dollars for parking. And I asked the guy. I said, uh, I told him, I said, I'm waiting for the comedy club to open. If I give you the ten bucks. How long? And he goes, I let you stay here till eight o'clock. So I said, perfect, you know. So I gave him ten bucks, and um, I had just parked, and I was like, I'm gonna go look at the Laugh Factory because I I knew I had passed it on the way to the store. I said, I'm gonna go walk by the Laugh Factory and check it check it out. I mean, the very first red light I'm at, waiting to go across the street. Fucking Craig Robinson is walking across the street at the same time, and I mean, I was. I was on the phone with my mom telling her, I just made it to California, just parked my van. I go, you won't believe it. There's a guy from Hot Tub Time Machine. Just that quick. It was crazy. So, Um, yeah. Yeah. Who's the favorite person that you've met that's a celebrity? Uh, Hands down, Damon Wayans. Yeah? Oh, man, I couldn't believe it. You know, I'm I'm good friends with his son, actually. You know, as good as you can, as good a friend as you can be for somebody who, you know, he made Marty's kind of like his home club. You know, he, he didn't live far from Marty's. So when Damon Jr. Uh, was in town or not shooting like movies and sitcoms, he would come to Marty's a lot to practice sets. And like before he went and did like a major show, he would come to Marty's. We'd let him ride on stage. He could do as long as he wanted. You know, he would practice his sets. And so, um, man, finally, after like three years of Jr. coming through Marty's and always like, I mean, David Jr. had came through. Let's see, Marlon had came through. Um, Sean even came through one night and brought his son. Um, um, Keenan Jr. came through. I mean, I met almost the whole family. Sean Tateway is the cousin. But I, I used to tell David all the time, dude, I want to meet your dad so bad. I grew up watching Homie the Clown. You know, I grew up watching The Living Color. I grew up watching, like, The Last Boy Scout was my favorite movie for a long time. You know, I've always loved Bruce Willis. And, uh, Finally, one day, David fucking Wayans walks through the door. I couldn't believe it, you know. And um, so he came to watch Junior, of course. So Junior does a set, and Marty gets on stage, and um, 
that he sees me, you know, because I'm already, I was always on the smoke pad, I already had a smoke pad, and I was always out there, really, because I'd already heard everybody's stuff, but that night, he, he knew, I knew Damon was there, so he seen me in the back, he goes, he goes, he looked at Damon Jr., he goes, I got a really funny comic that, that takes over the club for me when I'm not around, if you want to, if you'd be cool and uh, watch him, you know, and Damon kind of looked back, and, uh, and Marty asked me to the stage, I couldn't believe it. So I got to perform for him, too. And he said he watched me. He said he liked me. You know, he, he had a lot of good stuff to say to me. It was amazing. You know, wow. I couldn't believe it. That's amazing. He took, a picture, he took a picture with me outside of Marty's. I still got the picture. Yeah. How cool. I want to see that picture sometime. <laughs> yeah, it was when my hair was just growing out. It was like the right, it was kind of like, oof. It was, it was oofing out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, the shutdown, you're, you're a headliner and a feature both, right? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So when the shutdown happened, that had to hit you financially, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no work. Yeah. So do you give out your Venmo or your cash app? I didn't even know I had a cash app, but I guess I do have a cash app, um, when you told me that you were going to ask about it, I looked it up and I got one. It's a uh, money sign Easter Army, capital E, capital A. And uh, I remember setting it up. Yeah, I remember setting it up when I started the, um, I think somebody from the Periscope, you know, I do the Periscope show on Periscope a lot. And one of my Periscope uh, uh, people hit me up and told me to set that up. That's glad you told just Somebody, somebody sent me a message and it's on the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Technology. So, um, so if you want to help out to Thomas Easter by supporting him, it's Venmo dollar sign Easter Army. No, cash app. Cash app yep. dollar sign Easter Army. At Cash App. Got it. So, let's see. Where can where do you want people? You you're all over the internet. Where can they best help you, or buy anything that you've got out there? Is there merchandise or recordings? Um. Yeah, that's the thing. I didn't. Um. I made a bunch of shirts one time, and. Uh, Maybe two people bought them, <laughs> so I gave the rest of comics at Marty's and stuff. And then um, I didn't ever record my, my album yet or anything like that, you know. So um, I guess uh, if you want to, you know, show show love on, on my uh, on my Periscope show, uh, I'm starting to do that again on Periscope until until I can, you know. As long as I can afford weed, I mean, I'm not going to be able to afford it much longer. But, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully this will be, this will be over soon. We'll all be getting back to doing our thing. Uh, I just bought a mixer before this went down and I was going to start my podcast again. Probably still going to have to do the podcast. I'm going to order some microphones. So join my YouTube page if you want. I'm on, uh, you just look up my name, Thomas Easter. Uh, you can find me under most social media platforms. Under what? Thomas Easter, uh, I, I don't, you know, I use my real name. I don't have like a Hollywood made-up name. That's my actual real name and everything. So, you what? know, just remember. what's the name yeah. of your podcast? Oh, it was called Cloudy and Rowdy. But uh, like I said, it's on my YouTube page, which is just under Thomas Easter. So I, I doubt if you, you if you Google Cloudy and Rowdy, it'll probably direct you to that to my YouTube page. Got it. Because yeah, I couldn't afford to keep going with the iTunes and everything. So, um, let me see. The shutdown has made people either greedy or it's brought out their humanity. Yeah, man. It, I, you know, I was very, like I said at once, I don't like to use the word disappointed because who am I to tell you that I'm disappointed? But it really was, uh, you know, bad to see how people would be on you know, when the camera's on someone, they're, they're all, uh, oh, I love people, and I hope everybody's safe, and, and no one gets hurt, and, and then, but if you was to follow them to Walmart, they're punching old ladies for fucking toilet paper, you know what I'm saying? It's like, come on, bro, like, 
I couldn't believe how many people, how selfish people were acting. You know, like buying all of the, everything like that is so selfish. It's, it, you know, if, if you would have just, if everybody would have just treated it normally, we would still have fully stocked stores and fully stocked shelves. You know, like um, because I've, I've used maybe two rolls of toilet paper this entire time, it's like Thank a normal. You you know, male, single male would, you know, like, I'm not going to go out there and fight nobody for toilet paper, you know? No way. Oh, my gosh. You know, my family, my my dad's family went through the whole, the whole, my dad's family went through the Holocaust. Every time I talk, there's feedback. My dad's family went through the Holocaust. And I think about poor little Anne Frank at a time like this. You know, like, she didn't have Facebook. You know, <laughs> let alone toilet paper. Probably. Yeah, exactly. Or, or food, for that matter, probably, most nights. She was probably back there having to eat termites, for all we know. Well, you know, there's people in other countries that live like that or are worse than this on a daily basis, too. So, you that's, know. That's right. So, hopefully, this will bring out people's humanity. I, I, you, you would hope so, but I just, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, you're supposed to have faith in humanity and stuff like that, but then when you use words like faith or or you say, like, it's in God's hands, people talk shit about you, you know? So it's like, you can't win for losing with people, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> totally. What are you, right. you going to do differently once you get out of your house? I'm going to do more mics. Before this happened, um, I, had, I had taken it for granted, you know, like, uh, my time at Marty's, what people don't understand is I was there seven days a week, pretty much, um, from five o'clock in the afternoon. Actually, from like I would do my four twenty show, and then I would go right to Marty's because I had the keys, and I would open. I go ahead and open the place early because I know Marty like to show up, and, and there'd be coffee already made, and I would take out the trash. I would do certain things for Marty because he was old, you know, and and uh, no one, and then a lot of them comics just took advantage of that place. They spit, you know, they 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 just. They, and so I would go early and, um, man, being there seven days and just having that unlimited stage time like that, people don't understand, man, unlimited stage time. There would be nights where, um, you know, people wouldn't show up till eight o'clock. So from five to eight o'clock, we could just me and like three or four comics could just sit on stage and talk shit, just rotate and just, you know, I mean, having that much stage time. So once I got back to Vegas and, and um, you know, it was kind of like the new guy again, really wasn't feeling a lot of these guys. I just wasn't going to mics, you know. I was only doing what book shows I could do. And uh, I think when this is over, buddy, I'm going to be hitting open mics, uh, sewer mics, garage mics. I don't care where it's at. All right, we'll do a mic on the top of the stratosphere. I don't care. <laughs> Will you come over here and entertain the veterans? Yeah, yeah, I'm down. Okay. Yeah, they don't let anybody on here right now, but when they do, I'll let you know. Awesome. Yeah, because some of them really need to laugh. Uh, that's all I'm about. I love to see them laugh. Yeah. Well, is there anything that you want to say before I hang up and let you have a good life? Yeah, I mean, just uh, want everybody to uh, not only stay safe, but like I said, stay sane. Okay? Um, just uh, know that, uh, you know, Whatever your religion is, right? Um, what we say is God won't put you through nothing you can't make it through. Hello? So uh, we're going to make it through this, and um, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. I Thank love you. you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much, Thomas. I'll turn off the Facebook thing.